Hey guys, I have been arguing on social media all over the place recently about how our current government completely disregards the limitations of powers on the federal government that are written right into our constitution. They act like they're not even there. And while doing this, I've discovered that what I believe is a majority of the people I was involved with in these discussions have absolutely no idea of the objective truths that come from our founding era. And so I decided to do some videos on constitutional clauses that many people misinterpret or just get flat out wrong. Now, a lot of you in this audience will already know a lot of these things, but hopefully there are some nuances of the history I'm going to give you that you could learn from, which would be cool. So to start it off today, I want to talk about the Constitution's General Welfare Clause. I don't think there's anything in the Constitution that has been so misunderstood and misconstrued and misused. All right, let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back. So liberals for the longest time have intentionally misinterpreted this clause to mean that the federal government can provide any form of welfare for or any situation they deem fit. Not true. This is a great way to get people to vote for you. Vote for me. I'll give you more free shit. And more and more mainstream thought is buying into this nonsense, but there are also universities with sanity and objective historical truth supporting their arguments that the way the lefties have argued for the general welfare clause is to be an ATM for every vote-grabbing scheme under the sun, and it's bogus and a flat-out lie. For example, William & Mary Law School says that the General Welfare Clause of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 of the Constitution enumerates a power to provide for the common defense and general welfare. Now, this is 100% true, but the devil is always in the details. It means, what does general welfare literally mean? They go on to say that a literal interpretation of this clause would authorize Congress to legislate for any national purpose, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic, in ways that would be precluded under the prevailing understanding of limited enumerated powers. But the conventional doctrine rejects the general welfare interpretation of lefties and construes the general welfare clause to confer the so-called spending power, a power only to spend but not too regularly for national purposes. Let me explain this in Vulgate language, or language of the common man on the street. During the original Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, Founding Father Benjamin Franklin proposed a tax on the creation and maintenance of canals. You might be thinking, what the hell is he talking about canals for? Canals in those days were how merchandise was distributed to the local stores in cities and towns. Ships would bring merchandise into the ports of a city. They would then be offloaded onto what would be considered trucks in those days, but were wagon trains and such, things like that, that were run by horses or mules. They would then drive the merchandise to a local canal where there would be boats waiting for them to arrive. The merchandise, which could be food, blankets, guns, ammunition, anything really for the stores to sell to the people, would then be offloaded onto the boats in the canal. In many of these canals, the boats would be pulled along by a rope that was tied to a horse or a mule that would pull the boat down the canal by way of a walkway that was designed for that purpose. And what would happen is they would pull these boats up to certain docks along the way of the canal where merchants would offload what was theirs and take them right inside their stores or if their stores were further away from the canals, they would offload them onto their own transportation and take them to the stores. So many people would think that this was a great idea. It helps everybody by getting the merchandise to where it needs to go so that they can sell it. Now, fortunately for us, founding father Roger Sherman of Connecticut argued against this idea. His argument was, and this is very important for you to understand this, that this would be approving a tax that would be on all of the peoples of the United States of America, while only certain specific people would benefit from the tax money. For example, you can't tax people that want to buy products from mercantile establishments to get those products there. That's ridiculous. A business expense that has nothing to do with the people who want to buy the products. 
And what about people who don't purchase things from a store, from a mercantile business, from general stores, if you will? There would be millions and millions of people like that. So why should they pay a tax when they don't see a benefit? Fortunately for us, Roger Sherman's rejection was adopted and the motion to propose a tax for the building and maintenance of canals was rejected. Now, it didn't end there. This rejection of an idea proposed by the great Benjamin Franklin became the subject of many across the new states, the colonies, if you will. And since this was a time when the Constitution was being designed at Independence Hall in Philadelphia during that excruciatingly hot summer, the delegates who would debate, argue, propose, and reject the ideas coming from Independence Hall started arguing the very idea that Roger Sherman had. So the spending power of the Constitution, which is something that all politicians in D.C. have forgotten about, it doesn't matter which party. They no longer abide by it. But the spending power that is written into the Constitution says that if the Constitution is, says that the Congress is allowed to propose a tax to pay for a program that they created, then everyone paying the tax must be able to reap some benefit. And that program to begin with, this is the important part that they've all forgotten. Doesn't matter which party, the Uniparty has forgotten this. Any program that the Congress creates must be constitutional. Now, what does that mean? It means that the power to do that program has to be in Article 1, Section 8, known as the enumerated powers. The 18 enumerated powers that the Congress has. If it's not there, guess what? It's illegal. Now, if an amendment is created and passed by the states, you add that to their power. This would be like Obamacare. That's not in the 18 enumerated powers, and I don't remember any amendment that says that you can have Obamacare or government health programs. So guess what? Obamacare is 100% unconstitutional, according to the General Welfare Clause. So as you can see, this is complete opposite of what the freaks on the left in the Congress and the rhino establishment folks will tell you that the General Welfare Clause means today. Talk about not understanding limitations of power. So there you see, folks, the General Welfare Clause does not mean that the government gets to push any spending or programs on anybody they want who will vote for them. No, what it meant was general welfare, general meaning all. That if you're going to do something that you would have to cause a tax for, that it must benefit everyone who pays the tax. And we don't do that anymore. All right. Make sure you subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Share our videos with like-minded friends who want to stay informed with what's really going on. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one. I remember the days All those years ago that never fade away And I remember your face When you hit the ground I can recall the time and place